And we are live. Welcome, coaches. How are y'all doing this beautiful evening? I shouldn't say beautiful. I don't know but where how it is where you're at, but we're in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, so if this gets cut out halfway through, I've, it's because I've totally lost power, and I'm in the uh, in a swamp. But I am here with the man, the myth, the legend. I'm sure you know him because of uh, his. He's blowing up on Twitch. Uh, Coach McLean, man, how are you doing tonight? You, everything all right? It's it's great. The weather actually is beautiful here right now. So um, I do have that leg up on you, but yeah. took a heartbreaking right in, loss man. to uh, in in Madden, and I'm just trying to recut. No, it's it's all good. That game, I, it's all you can do is laugh at this point. Yeah, and if, for those that don't know, uh, Coach McLean and I are in the same uh, Madden franchise. The what? This is this is one of the coolest things. And Coach Canfield, hey, hats off to you for putting this thing together, man. Um, 32 teams with 32 different coaches across the country. We're all playing. We're having fun. And uh, coach right here came in and actually has the best team. He lucked into it, and he's struggling, man. He's struggling. And I'm trying to get him to give me his best players. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Yeah, he's really looking out for me there. He's trying to. He's just trying to <laughs> siphon all the talent off of my team because I keep losing. That's what it's hey, all about, man. All right, so what we're going to do is, first off, Coach, for those that don't know who you are, could you please give us a little history on your football journey? Uh, yeah, so uh, attended Baylor University, graduated high school, had a couple of small small colleges here in the state of Texas that had an opportunity to kind of pursue that, but uh, wanted to roll the dice at a bigger school, so got accepted to Baylor, walked on, um, and redshirted my freshman year. And then uh, the four, the following four years were the first four years of the browse era at Baylor. So that was kind of my indoctrination into, you know, really starting to learn football in depth. Um, and so played from, I was in the program 2007 to 2011. Uh, my senior year was the year that Robert Griffin won the Heisman. Um, and we won the Alamo Bowl, set a couple of records that year that ended up getting broken in the, you know, the following years. But, year you know, it that. is what it is. Um, but then from there, um, <coughs> I, you know, did a, a lap in the the business world and, and knew that it wasn't for me and went back to school and started pursuing my master's while uh, GAing at Tarleton, uh, which is a former Division II school, now Division One here in the state of Texas. Um did that for a year and really just, I, I really saw myself getting into the high school level. So when after got my teaching certification and, and really lucked out, I've, I've kind of just managed to be a cat the, this whole time during football of, of landing on my feet in either a program that's making a great turnaround or, you know, lucking into an interview with a traditional powerhouse here in, in the state of Texas in uh, 2015 that spring interviewed with uh, Salina High School, which at the time was held the state record for most state championships, and um, uh, was fortunate enough to be offered the the job as the receivers coach. And that first season, we actually start the season fifteen and zero, and make it to the state championship game. And I was like, dude, high, coaching high school ball is easy. This is what I don't. Know, what do people make all this stress? And then like the eighth play of the game, our quarterback breaks his arm. We end up losing. But you know, I'm not bitter. Um, so that was 2015 and had some shuffling around on staff got retired I moved from receivers coach to quarterbacks coach do that for a few years and then was recently promoted to offense coordinator here so um, I'm in more of a walk around role uh, just with the way our staff is put together but uh, yeah man that's that's the the long and short of it okay all right well uh we're going to dive into that time at Baylor. We're going to talk a little bit about the transition from, because I'm always curious how your transition went from wide receiver to quarterback, because I went from running backs coach to quarterback and just that little thing. But first coaches, Hey, if this is the first time visiting my channel, welcome. Uh, if you like anything that has to do with football, uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell notification. So when you know, I, we have a show cast on and everything like that. And if you have any questions while this is live, Go ahead and put them in the chat, and we will answer them. Right now, we have some coaches already in there. Coach Flynn, how you doing? Coach uh, Gottthorpe, I hope I said that right. I am illiterate. I'm a math teacher. 
Uh, Johnny, what's going on? Hunter, he uh, says for you to tank and get Burrow and then to uh, take one for the team and trade me everybody so, you know, I can win the Super Bowl with, with Tommy Boy. Uh, Adam says what's going on. We've got Heath from Australia. Hello, sir, and Coach uh, Greenfield, what's going on? So the first thing I want to know is when you came, when you started, so were you, when you were redshirted or you, you walked on that very first year, right? That was the first year with Bryles? Um, my, How, my true freshman year, uh, was the last year of Guy Morris. So okay. my red shirt freshman year, 2008 was the first season with Browse. Okay. So the first thing I want to know is how much of a shock was it going from that first offense to now Browse is like, was it the, the Browse when he first came in, was that the same style of offense that the Browse when he left, like ultra fast, wide splits, power yeah. running, or was it a gradual progression? It honestly, and this is going to sound like a cop out. It was a little bit of, of both. Um, I think that that coach and the staff that they brought in had that big picture vision, but they knew that you can't, you know, you can't just sign up for a formula one, formula one race with a Toyota Corolla, right? Like there were pieces that needed to be brought in and, and groomed and things of that nature. We were able to do some things in space and spread people out. Uh, and run the ball effectively, even in a four and eight season. Um, but it, you know, it was, it was incrementally installed and we were, we were groomed to play fast and we were groomed to play in space, but total like half field isolation and things of that nature, they kind of came later, even after I was gone. And so I definitely think that it was in there. It was in their pocket for big picture long-term, but it was something that, you know, you, when you take over a three and nine program that hadn't been to a bowl game in 14 years, you can't just go out there and say, okay, you three guys stand still. We're only going to look at this guy, you yeah. know? So it was a little bit of both. Okay. What was, can you remember or put your thumb on the, when they did something, you went, Oh wow, this is kind of, this is actually different than what I'm used to. Yeah. Um, the first day. So there were two, there was the first day of off season with our new strength conditioning coach because he was very adamant that the attention to detail and the way that things were going to go was that was ringing down from the top, right? He, he and coach Browse were communicated multiple times a day and that they were going to mirror the strength and conditioning off season program as much as possible to the style of play that we were going to have. And then the first day of spring ball, um, because, you know, a lot of people talk about how, well, it's not really written down and, you know, they just shoot from the hip and call plays. Well, <laughs> that we heard it a lot and we my room kind of got lucky because we had the only coach on staff that didn't come with them from Houston or have ties with them and at tech or at Stephenville um, and so he's trying to learn on the fly with us so he would write things down for him and then we could look at them but everybody else on the offensive side those four or five words would be said they knew exactly what to do and it, I mean we were even in spring of 2008 we're running a play every six to seven seconds in practice from day one shorts and t-shirt like that, that was instilled in us. And you know, the first time it happens and you're just like, Oh crap, like guys that play 60, 70 plays a game, they're, they're falling out before we get to team, you know, just wow. because of the repetitions. And we, it was just a shell shock. It was something that we weren't used to, uh, but it definitely prepared us to, to put teams that had superior athletes in situations to where we could get them on their heels and take advantage early on. Yeah. Okay. So the tempo was right away. Now, was it the same? Cause I've always wanted to know, is the tempo Baylor style, the same tempo and speed as what Chip Kelly was doing at Oregon? Or do you see those as two different kind of tempos? I distinctly remember having a conversation in our training room with Rob and a couple other guys because 2009, 10, 11, that's when, I mean, Oregon was, they were, yeah. they were doing their thing and, you know, playing a national championship game. And, you know, they had some really good football players, but we just sat there and we were like, I, I don't think they play faster than us. I think that, I think they're West coast fast. And I think we're Baylor fast. I just, we just, we felt like they did things quickly, but they didn't sustain it on drives where, you know, we could run an eight play drive and go 70 yards and do it in less than 30 seconds. You know, we just had that type of 
explosivity within our our skill set and our and our players and we we honestly when they would play you know college wrap up on sunday mornings and we'd be in the training room we just never felt like anybody had the ability and the depth to do that for as long or as a sustained amount of time as we did i i completely agree uh i remember getting into tempo with oregon and chip Kelly. i'm like man they're fast and the, i can't i don't know what game i saw of baylor but when I saw Baylor, I went, holy crap, they're even faster than Oregon. And they actually do it the entire game. And that's what I, I, I always – that's what's going to stick with me with Bryles is not his offense. It's just that he kept the same style the entire game. And he was like Steve Spurrier on steroids saying, hey, it's not my job to stop my offense. This is what we do. This is what we're going to hang our hat on. If you can stop it, great. We'll, have, we'll slug it out. If not, it's going to be a long night for you. I'm going to – I'm going to try to put 100 up. And was that the mentality like they were trying to teach y'all the whole time? Like, hey, this is what we're going to do. We don't care what happens. 100%. 100%. When we're out there, we're calling plays to get six, seven yards of play. We're going to take shots, and we're going to score as often as possible, as fast as possible. And again, like you said, it's your job to stop us. It's not our job to stop us. So – you know, I think that especially when you look at a 60 minute game, when you're in that last five minutes and it is a 30 plus point margin, I mean, there were times where, you know, we've got a 35, 40 point lead. There's, you know, seven to eight minutes left in the fourth quarter. Rob's still in the game, right? Because those are those are opportunities to play against starters that we have to take advantage of, right? Ain't no rest for the wicked. Like we got to go out there and we got to continue to get better. Now, when he gets inside that five six minute mark, we're gonna do what coaches do. We're gonna take care of each other, and everybody's gonna leave here healthy, right? But up until about that, like you're gonna get a full dose of who we are. And I, another game that sticks out with that, and everyone was talking bad about it. it was that one game i can't remember who it was. i want to say oklahoma when it was raining cats and dogs and it just the downpour game or whatever and they just still did what they do like they didn't modify the game plan they didn't huddle they didn't they were like this is who we are rain or shine and i respect the hell out of that because i thought that's that's being who you are yeah um i mean there's there's the the ou game there's also the i think it was 15 uh iowa state game both of them pouring down rain obviously iowa state ou two slightly different opponents but like you said i mean you come out and and you start slow that doesn't we're not going to abandon who we are we're going to run the ball down your throat and we're going to take shots and eventually you know we may not hit four out of eight but the two out of eight that we do hit are still going to hurt you pretty bad. And they're going to hurt you to where you start to second guess what your game plan is. And you're going to, we're going to get you on your heels and thinking a little bit too much. And it may take us a little longer to get started, but as long as we stay true to who we are, I mean, especially you look at cotton bowl against Michigan state. I wasn't even there, but I can tell you what happened. I mean, you, they're playing this, the way their secondary is playing, it says throw the ball, right? Yeah. The only problem was is that, you know, you got into a you got into a shootout late in the second half and you just certain plays weren't executed, but it hadn't there was never a change in execution. There was never a change in in game plan or play calling. What is the defense giving us that fits into who we are? That's what we're gonna do. And, you know, when you lose games like that, it's really easy for people to say, well, why didn't you just do this? Why didn't you just get into double tight and run the ball and eat the clock? Well, because that's not who we are, right? Now you're asking guys that play 15 to 20 snaps a game to play 40, and they may not be conditioned for that, and they may give up something on the backside, and our quarterback may get a broken rib. So there's just all those situations that that it's really easy from 20,000 feet to say, well, why didn't you just make this adjustment? And the people that just stay true to who they are, it's like you said, those are the ones that, you just respect the crap out of. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, on that note, um, Coach Greenfield has a good question. Do you think – did Leach have a big change on Bryles when he was at Texas Tech, or is this what – like, did Bryles – this is what he ran at Stevensville the whole time, and he was just a, there as a stepping stone to get in the college game. And I know you're speaking for somebody else, but what are your thoughts on that? Uh, for me, pers here's what's great about this is that the Browse coaching tree at the high school level is so much bigger than people know just because of his time in Stephenville 
And I mean, that that's high school and Tarleton being in Stephenville produces so many football coaches for our state that his his network is is really big. And there's guys that played for him in 94. There's guys that played for him in 98 that if I walked up to him and said, uh, special blue left uh, jet 18 hide, they know exactly what I'm talking about. That's the handshake. Because there's certain plays that they still run that the verbiage and the vernacular stays the same. And you can have those conversations. I think the biggest thing that Leach, if if I was to project, because I'd never had this conversation with Coach, but if if I was to say what Leach had from an influence standpoint on him, it was what you do is what you do, right? I've, I've heard stories about how Leach, you know, guys would bring stuff to him and, you know, okay, that sounds great. Hey, that this team is is going to be vulnerable there. What do we take out? And then there's just super dramatic, like dead silence. Right. And I think that's something that, you know, we still would install stuff on a Tuesday or something for a game, but if it didn't work by Wednesday, scrap it, it's done. Just be who you are. So I think that the simplicity factor was kind of reiterated when he got to Lubbock of just being who you are, staying true to, to your foundation, but there's so much of that offense that that really its infancy started at the high school level at Stephenville. When you win four state championships in 10 years, you know, yeah. there's some success there that you can take and translate to a Houston or somewhere else. Yeah. And I agree. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to switch gears a little bit. I want to get into uh, to some wide receiver play. All right. And the main one is what was like the biggest eye opening thing when you actually got to Bay, uh, Baylor, who you're, uh, Babers, was that who your coach was as a yes. wide receiver? What was one thing he taught you that you didn't know? And you're like, oh, my goodness, that that is a game changer right there. So, and I actually, I've talked about this with a couple of their coaches. Um, and it's something that my high school coach, who I have a really good relationship with, he was our play caller. He was the receiver's coach. He used to get so mad at us because we're 16, 17-year-old kids toe-tapping the sideline at practice and in drills and stuff. And, you know, his big thing was you only need one foot. You only need one foot, right, which was 100% true. But we weren't we didn't have a skill or a technique to cement. This is how you focus on just having one foot so you can put more emphasis on catching the ball. Um, And day one, Babers comes out there and he's like, look, drill we're going to do every day. It's called the hydrant. We're going to put up an M drill cone. We're going to work it every day at practice and we're going to work it every pregame. And it's a, it's just a catch radius extension um, and dragging your back toe, extending your body outside, out of bounds, past the, past the sideline. And the first time he told it to us was in a meeting and he didn't say anything about, you know, this is where I came up with this. This is blah, blah, blah. When he was at Arizona back in the nineties, I'll never, me and my buddies, me and my old teammates still joke about it. He used to bring up Dennis North, Northcutt, like, you know, they were just best friends, like Dennis Northcutt, you know, 16 years or, you know, his career, his NFL career always got longer, but he, he brought up tape from when they were at Arizona and, and Arizona was playing on uh, a convergent f- It was a baseball football field. Mm-hmm. So sideline, part of it was chalked over the dirt. And he he tells us a story about Dennis Northcutt hydrants out of bounds on a fade ball and catches it and he ends up under the under the bleachers where the kids are where the defense is resting and the ref runs over and throws his hands up saying catch and um and then he pulls up the clip and it was that moment that I was like look this guy may not know anything else but this is the most amazing piece of re- receiver technique I've ever seen in my life. Cause it's something that, you know, nobody had ever, I'd never heard anybody talk about anything like it. And it's just simply planting a foot at the sideline, extending, throwing your knee laterally to, ex- you know, extend your catch radius. And for that field, shoot the chalk turf field, you know, clip the grass and then a, or a grass field, clip the grass and then a turf field, shoot the beads because refs split up the responsibility, right? One guy's watching the catch, one guy's watching the feet. So if I can manipulate, I may be out of bounds when I totally secure it. But if I create the perception that this foot has been in bounds for a longer time than normal, right? Then people aren't going to be, they're not going to be able to come together and say, well, what was the exact moment 
when he secured the catch because I can tell you which bead was in the air, right? It's just like the Michael Jordan free throw thing. When he pumped the ball, it created the perception that he floated because it changed what people thought was his center mass. Instead of seeing the arc of his body, they focused on the ball staying on a flat plane, right? So that's what we're doing. We're changing the perception, not the reality. Oh my God, that is that is game changer right there. You're you're essentially manipulating two different people to give 100%. you a, a little bit more time to, like you said, if because that that's all I look for on game nights or game nights or when I'm watching video of of a game going on. It's like, hey, where's his foot at? There's there's the grass right there. I'm not even looking at the ball. So, oh man, that's why he's big time. That's why you're big time, man. Okay. Um. So that that's the drill that you, you know expand and you're like holy crap that's amazing. Another thing that I've noticed when I was I've been watching Baylor is how they block down the field wide receiver wise. Um, where knowing that that's something I struggle at as a coach. Like I'm not, I don't know the techniques as well. You know, I I know capture the outside shoulder and go, everything like that. What are some drills or some coaching cues that I can learn to get better at teaching my wide receivers? to block other than saying that if you don't block, you don't get the rock. <laughs> Shout out to Kaduti. Yeah. Um, so our big thing was our job was immediately made easier because of splits. You can throw an uncovered slot receiver and you don't have to own the outside number because if we're throwing the, if we're throwing the uncovered guy, it's because the linebacker key sweats out there. Ain't, ain't nobody near to make the tackle right so we we eliminated that part and then it just became a matter of will i spent two years having to do a blocking drill against a kid who now play who is like an all-star in the cfl playing defensive end at six seven and it's all the the coaching point of leverage and you know driving the bus and hand placement is so important and i think a lot of it gets lost on you know, just little aspects, things that you hear coaches say, but they don't just drive home at nauseum. Thumbs up, like holding's not illegal. Getting caught holding is, is illegal, right? That's against the rules. So it's the same thing you hear offensive line guys say. If my hands are inside and my thumbs are up, I could have your jersey. I could just be pushing you with my knuckles, or I could be all the way inside of your shoulder pads. That ref isn't going to say anything because my elbows are tied to my ribs and my thumbs are straight in the air. But the second my elbows get wide and I start, you know, clap blocking, now we've, we've lost our competitive edge. So we get an advantage by spreading out the defense and creating that space. And then the short six inch step, when you bring the hands, the thumbs straight up in the air, now you just turn into a bus driver. You just steer the car, take the thumbs where you want to go, yada, yada, yada. But with the splits that we played with, that was on the receiver, not us. Were, were, we were those told, set or did y'all have the leeway? Like, okay, this is where, I, this is where they want us to be, but I, I have the freedom to make it even wider if I wanted. We, our splits were... There was, there was a minimum, and then it was widen until either you're uncomfortable or he stops moving, right? So if I'm comfortable standing on the sideline hash and that guy comes all the way out there, then go stand out there. Because essentially, if it's a pass play, nobody else can bother me. And if it's a run play, my guy has zero possibility of making a play at all. There's just no chance for him. to. He's playing – He's playing in a third of a 53 and a third field, right? There's just no, he can't rally past me and make a play because of how wide we're playing. If he stops moving, I stop widening. If I get out there and I'm like, man, if he drives inside on an uncovered, I really can't get flat and make that cut block. Okay, then I need to stop. But those were the parameters, right? Here's your minimum. You have to be at least this wide. Be comfortable in the splits to the point where you can take it as wide as you want as long as it's still affecting the defender. And when a guy goes out and he catches, you know, a 50-yard touchdown in the first quarter, you're going to affect that guy where you line up the whole game, right? So. Wow, that that's the smart splits, but applied instead of to the offensive line, you're now applying it to the wide receivers. 100%. And I noticed that 
what were the splits for the wide for the OL? Because I didn't know, I didn't see like the three foot splits that a lot of air raid teams or anything like that. Those the splits the O line used looked like they were maybe eighteen inches to twenty four inches. They yeah. they weren't. They were just standard splits. Right, just minimum of eighteen. But you you if you're if you're comfortable in twenty four, be in twenty four. And that was because of I mean we pulled guys, you know, forty fifty percent of the time in the run game anyway. So we weren't we weren't really a like a zone team. Yeah. Talk about that just a little bit. Cause that, that was one of the biggest things I discovered when I was breaking down Baylor from like the whole brawls era is he y'all pulled a lot. Was there a reason for that? Or was that just something like coach brawls? He fell in the gap schemes of camp and not the inside zone, or was that more schematic? It just worked better. What, what was the reasoning behind all the pulls? We, he always said that he came up with a veer background mm. and, and just, he was very gap driven. We didn't, we call, we use the word zone, but it wasn't what everybody else calls zone. And we no, did that sorry. with a couple at, at, at all. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that in my opinion, again, never sat down and asked the guys this, but I think that when you have an offensive line coach, like coach Randy Clements, you you play to your strengths and what our strengths were were we were big but our guys could move and from pre-snap you're lightening the box already because of splits and when you can do that you're double you only have to have you know you're big enough to where you can isolate three people and you really only have to have one double team well awesome let's go ahead and give ourselves an advantage because we're athletic enough we'll pull one guy and that creates for me it to, we turned basically every pulling play into a counter play because we're not we're not pulling for we're not pulling left to hook and get left we're pulling left to block left and never leave the hash or never leave the a gap and that was the beauty is that for whatever reason the scheme worked out to where the pulls and the isos our backs never they rarely left their vertical path till they're 6 yards downfield yeah. They could just stay true, take their bucket and run to the center's butt and whatever near gap opened, commit to it and stay to it till you hit seven yards. You're absolutely right. Like that was, and that's another thing that I liked was the simplicity of, Hey, the running backs, it seemed like regardless of the blocking scheme, it was always the center's butt crack. So they had that whole, like, Hey, this is where you're going. This is where you're going. It doesn't matter what the scheme is. Your, your aiming point is the same throughout everything. Hundred percent, one hundred percent. I mean, there's nothing I add to that. You just nail on the head. <laughs> As you can tell, I've done a lot of research on, on uh, Baylor. That's that's like my unicorn right there. Uh, Coach Thompson, welcome. He's from Columbia. Hopefully, you are dry. We are. It's getting pounded out here. It sounds like I'm in the uh, the perfect storm. Um, so I let's let's go. What have you taken from Baylor? wide receiver wise and apply to the high school when you were the wide receiver coach were there any drills and techniques did you do you use that uh the uh drill that the m drill or whatever oh we hydrant oh my hydrant. gosh yes. I, so my first year here we're playing a cross town kind of cross town rival big rival they're a good pro program we're a good program and uh I, i'd only been here a month and a kid that ended up being our leading receiver and, and setting some receiving records that year. Um, we run like a, just like a choice route to him, sprint out choice where he's, you know, he can curl in, he could break out, whatever. And um, he sticks right at the pylon and it was ugly. It wasn't very good, but he slams his foot right at the sideline and the ball just happened to get there in time to where he didn't really have to drag. And you would have thought it was the greatest catch that anybody had ever seen. Now it was a nice. big game, but, we took that and and what it gave me was that in week three of our season, I could now turn on tape to any kid in the program and be like, if you question this drill and let me show you the kid that you watch on Fridays, do it perfect. You know, that the the hydrant will always be a part of whatever program, whatever receiver core I'm connected to, because you know, it got a lot of publicity when Colin Johnson got that somebody got a still shot of him doing it on the sideline for texas a couple of years ago mm -hmm. because colin johnson's like six six so when his legs up in the air it looks you know crazy big 
but the good ones come from the 510, the 59, the 58 kids because they're the ones that need to extend that radius, you know, that they're open, but where they're open is out of bounds and the quarterback's got to know that he can throw the ball there. So he rips it and we use our, we turn our shoulders and we do like a stationary version of the Michael Irvin, like leg kick against the bills. And, and we extend our catch radius and defend the ball from the defender and, ex, and, and secure the catch that way, but that'll never go away. And then for me, the biggest thing, if there's one thing that I took away from Kendall and Dino and, and coach was that you're out here. And this offense is built to be fast. So don't do anything that's not. If you're going to run a route, do it quickly. Do it right now. If it's an RPO, if we're play action and something, you'll know that, but that's a one-off. 95% of the time, when you go, go. And that's the biggest reason that they went and recruited guys that they recruited. That's the reason that we signed a, a tight end at a high school that weighed 147 pounds and had 100 yards receiving in two years because he showed up to camp and he ran a 444, right? Hey, we I don't care what your film looks like. You can come play for us, right? Or go find kids in East Texas that everybody said was a DB and he turns out to be the all-time leading receiver in program history. That's that's why you do that because I don't I don't care what everybody else said. You're football fast, so go be that every play. And we'll tell you where to go, and how, and you just do it quickly, and you'll be open. Okay. How much thinking was involved with that? Like, do they have to know a lot of different route concepts and plays and everything like that? Or was there just a handful, and then that allowed them to play as fast as they could? And while you answer that, my cat somehow snuck up, so I'm going to go throw it outside. I'm not <laughs> throwing it outside. I'm going to place it outside. But answer that question, please. Um. So when Coach Babers got the, the head job at Syracuse, he somehow the Syracuse newspaper was contacting a list of former players. And a, a guy called me and said, tell me, tell me about this offense, you know, blah, 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 Eastern and Bowling Green. And, and at that point, Dino was considered, he, that was considered a Baylor offense. It just was. And I said, if it's anything like what it was here, it'll be the simplest, most confusing offense you've ever seen. To anybody on the outside that comes and watches and listens to practice, they'll have no idea what's being said. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. There's a few plays that get dressed up certain ways, and they do them as fast as possible. So that was a, the short answer to your question is, it was a few plays that, with little tweaks and variances are essentially the same thing, which allows us to run them 60, 70, 80 times a game and just do it as fast as possible. Okay. So how fast, what, like, what was the biggest number of plays that you have run in while you were there at Baylor? Like in a practice? No, no, no. Okay. Just, let's do twofold. How many plays in practice did you run? And then what's like the, the top out of plays in a game? Um, so we never counted full plays because there's a lot of way to sneak like within that offense, there's a lot of way to like sneak some rest. So you don't really count those, but do, there were, I mean, the goal of team periods was ever a play every six seconds. So it could wow. be blitz. It could be seven on seven. If there was, if we had, if we had seven offensive players in a drill, the goal was to be, and I, I mean, it, it, they really correlated the tempo to run, to run hole too you're looking at a play every eight to 10 you're playing as fast as possible, even with the big boys, but that's where the conditioning came in. But from practice standpoint, the goal, you know, a good day was a great day was six seconds. A good day was seven and a bad day was eight. Right. And that could be depending on depth and spring ball and who's hurt and who's tweaked and all that. And then in a game, the goal was every 10 to 11. Yeah. Okay. So in practice, was there someone like with a stopwatch off the side, just screaming, Hey, faster, faster, faster. Or was it just like a more of an internal thing or um, how, how that work? A little bit of both there. I mean, there would be that situation. Babers would be sitting there counting us down, you know, and I, we do that here now. So play gets signaled and I'll just start counting four, three, two. And if it, if they don't snap it at, at or before one, we took too long and they're going to yell, get yelled at. And then the other version of that would be, I mean, how we were in charge of ourselves, 
ones and twos were in charge of that ourselves. If, if you run 15 plays in a row and you can't run that next play in seven seconds, well, just wave and the next guy goes and you just file in. And then it's your responsibility to take a mental note of the play you missed. And when you hear it again, make sure you're in. So if, if it was slow, you would hear it, but there was a lot of player accountability of make sure, you know, if we're empty, make sure we're five across and we're out there in five seconds and we're ready to run the play. Are you as fast offensively in the high school? Are you aiming for the six seconds if for great and eight for, you know, something's off or do you push um, that a little bit more? It'll be pushed a little bit. We're a little smaller school and we still do split practices. So my kids got it. They got to go through a 40 minute defensive practice before, you know, I even get them. So we're, but that for me, what that means is that you're not going to do it as often. So our team and our, 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 our first team and our second team, they're going to be that way because we need them to be, we need to practice that tempo every single day. We're not going to be six seconds, but our goal is eight. We're going to run a play every eight seconds. Okay. That is, that is really fast. I love it. You're speaking my language. Um, besides the hydro drill, I'm a wide receiver coach. What are, are two other drills I should run every single day of practice to get better? In your I opinion. Think, I think that you should run a, a, a simplified release drill. To Do you have a favorite release? Or are you showing them like eight different ones and letting the kids decide which one they like? Or are you all like, okay, so you have just two? Two releases. And the first one, it's really one and a half because not everybody can do the second one. But, it, man, if you can do the second one, you can you can punish a secondary in the first drive of the game, and they won't play the rest of the game the, the same way. It's I, I love it. And for a kid that basically played undersized his entire collegiate career – it was my favorite thing to do, but the first, you know, the well, first well release, you can't, you can't lead with that and then not even tell us what it is. Oh, I mean, I'll, you, I'll you, tell you, okay. You, the tease. first one just being the one, the one step release. <laughs> okay. When I say one step, you get one influence step, but it's gotta be first step or second step. If you can win now, go win now, right? Just take off. But if you need that one step, the big thing about that drill is setting up cones a slightly outside of their body frame that they, you have to be moving forward. Everything has to be moving forward. Cheat your alignment based on the line of scrimmage. If the guy, if if you're playing against a six-two corner that's got a nine-foot wingspan, but you're supposed to be on the line, we'll be on the tackle's butt. Don't go stand on the line of scrimmage. Manipulate that stuff, but then understand that every single step has to go forward. It has to go somewhere. And you either influence on your first step or your second step. And once you make that decision, slip, stack, catch the ball. The second one. The one that's fun, if you are confident in your ability, if you've got a guy that's he's physical, he may not look it, he may look it, either one, but he's a physical, aggressive player. It's just the straight bench press and throw. So guy comes up, he's gonna press, it's a run play away, first drop, first play of the drive, doesn't matter. Or, you know, you're in the red zone and you know that the fade ball's up, you know it's press man, it's good. Well, Every DB in America knows they have five yards to get their hands on you and reroute you. Well, that doesn't just apply for them. Shoot your hands inside, just like you're blocking him. Grab his shoulder pads, dump him on the ground inside mailbox. Do that one time. Do that one time in one of the first three weeks of your season. Nobody presses that kid. And that, yeah, that's using that's doing the same thing that defenders do to you, but just flipping around. Have you ever been called for an offensive pass interference if you've done that? Absolutely not. Oh man, Can't. okay. What's the rule? Yeah. What rule did you break? Yeah, because DBs can do it to, to wide receivers, and exactly nothing happens when they hem that kid up that tries to do his Twitter release, and they put him under the Gatorade cooler. Ain't nobody throwing a flag. <laughs> Twitter release. I like that. And. Heck yeah. Okay, so what is the mailbox? What is that? I'm stupid. Oh, that's that's Randy Moss, right? Mailbox. Gotcha. Shoot the hand, baby. Throw it gotcha. Up. We good. All right. Um, does anyone else other than you like run the Baylor offense as well as Baylor did? You know how you have some guys that say, "Hey, this is what we do. We we modeled it after it." Are they are they running like a watered down version? Because I've always wondered about that kind of style. So twofold. Nobody nobody runs the offense. Okay. As, and and the reason is, and and I've talked to to Heath about this a little bit, but the reason nobody runs it as good is because of the cohesion. You're talking about an offensive staff that 
had five people and four of them had worked together for over a decade. Our GA was coach Browell's son-in-law. Our inside receivers coach was his son. Our offensive line coach had been with him since the first state championship at Stephenville. Our quarterbacks coach was a student assistant for him when he was finishing his classes at Tarleton at Stephenville. Our operations guy was his athletic trainer at Stephenville. I mean, the depths of the cohesion, it's just unmatched. Now, there are guys who were on staff, who know the system, who have gone to high schools in Texas and have had great success and have broken records and have, you know, gotten freakish numbers out of their offense. But for me, that that's the difference. That's the thing that you can't, you have to match that organically from a cohesion standpoint before anything else. Cause there's so many things that people, there's just roadblocks and, you know, the understanding and mastery of it that you can't, you can't get just from, you know, Oh, well, I've been doing this for a couple of years. No, you're talking, you're talking about a group of five guys that have been doing, doing it together for a decade. So it's just, it's just different. It's the nuances that you don't know Correct. that everybody else knows. Okay. Your transition from wide receiver to quarterback, how big of it, like, did you have to go in and study during the offseason, like, I don't know anything. I'm diving into this. I'm looking at every single quarterback thing. Or did you have some knowledge or did you call up RG3 and was like, hey, give me everything you, you've got because I'm doing this? Um, I definitely didn't do the last one. Um, <laughs> not that I, I not that I don't think Griff would help me any way he could. I just – what he was doing at that time and what we were going to do in offense and what I knew he did in college, and they weren't the same. Gotcha. Um, but – what I did, I have one of my best friends. He's the offense coordinator for Limpscomb Academy in, in Tennessee for Trent Dilfer. And he is a quarterback freak. He is the guru, not just from a mechanic standpoint, but he's also the guru from install. I mean, he's been calling plays since he was 24. The guy's a freak. And uh, he had worked, he's been working, he worked with Jarrett Stidham when he was in high school through his college days, still works with him. You know, his, his roster is ridiculous and his play calling success is ridiculous. So the second that happened, I mean, that was one of the big reasons that the head coach felt comfortable with me making that transition. He said, you know, that you can call him or him, another guy if you have any questions and whatever they tell you, we're good with. So that was, I just, I mean, I got, when they told me it was happening, I called them and said, I need you to talk to me like I've never even heard the word quarterback. And from that standpoint, I had to pick and choose what was going to be valuable, especially within our practice structure, limited, you know, only having them for 40 minutes. Um, and so it became a lot of more concept based, you know, eyes here, you know, have it was very minimal, have a good foundation, you know, but understand we're reading one to two to three here's the why things of that nature and try and soak it up as fast as possible and, and just be a sponge anytime he was talking quarterback play what was one thing he told you that just clicked and was like i'm going to do that from from now until whenever i get out of coaching um one of the biggest things it's it's really funny the way it came out but one of the biggest things for me was that you know, I'll never forget. I had a younger teammate that he was talking. We were in the locker room. He was like, "Dude, this girl's so hot! Like, can't wait to like. I think I'm gonna ask her out." I was like, "Who is it?" He told me. I was like, ah, "That's skeptical." And he said, "Why?" I said, "Look at her foundation. You know, look. Start at the feet. Okay, does she have great ankles? Can't build a big house on shoddy foundation." And that was the first thing he told me. He said, that "At the end of the day, you got to set your feet." to throw them. every everything starts we start from the bottom set your feet if you if a quarterback's struggling start there don't worry about arm slot don't worry about release don't worry about any of that don't worry about him over torquing start with his feet and just continue to reiterate that and force those guys to get to get to a comfortable position with their feet and then worry about movement in the pocket timing and everything of that nature get to that comfort level reestablish your, your foundation, deliver a great ball. Okay. And you're right about the, uh, the ankles. You never see a, a skinny girl with really fat ankles. Facts. Yeah. Can't build, <laughs> can't build a big house on shoddy foundation. It's impossible. <laughs> and how did that first year go as a, as a brand new quarterbacks coach? It went good. Um, fortunately the, so 15, we make it to the state game 
and quarterback breaks his arm. Well, we basically graduated everybody off of that offense except for him. He broke a bunch of passing records. He came back. He knew he was a lot was going to be asked of him, and he was a really athletic kid. Started at free safety when he was a freshman on varsity. So it was more of like manage, maintain, you know, don't let him get overwhelmed because he's going to have to carry a couple guys to win us some games, things of that nature. So that made it really easy. Wasn't having to break in a new quarterback, wasn't having to deal with a big quarterback controversy or anything of like that. It was, hey, here's a senior, here's a record breaker, keep him healthy. So. All right. Now going into your very first, this year will be your very first year as an offensive coordinator, right? Yes. You picked a great time with the coronation and all yeah, of that. Dude, super easy. <laughs> What's your thought process going on as a brand new like play caller? Like what, what what have you been studying or have you been looking at? Like take me through your thought process of being a, a year one offensive coordinator. So the biggest thing is at the end of the day, you know, we've touched on it a couple of times. We're gonna be who we are, right? What whatever I believe in, whatever I think is gonna be our ident our identity, that's that's what we're going to be tailored around. And I spent a lot of time going, all right, here's my list. And then just trimming the fat and getting down to just going back and understanding it like, Oh, you love counter tray. All right. Are you super confident in calling it on third and three? Are you super confident that our kids are going to go out and execute, execute it? Are you super confident in it as a play from a consistency standpoint? Yes or no. What about ISO? How do you feel, you know, and just taking that list of 10 runs concepts, trimming it, going to your passing offense, trimming it. And then from that standpoint, getting all of that do, it's not important for me to understand what it's called. It's important for the kids to understand what it's called. And since we're not, we, we didn't go through a program revamp, it's not a new head coach. We're not starting from ground zero. I mean, it, we, we lost to a state runner up in the second round, right? We were a playoff team. These kids have been running a very similar version of their offense since they were in seventh grade, sometimes since fourth grade. So let me take my verbiage and tie it into what they're comfortable, comfortable and understand as much as possible and then move forward. Do I get to call everything exactly how I would call it or how I've heard it? you know, during the bulk of like my football confidence lifetime. No, but we're doing the same thing. We're just, you know, we're using different words to get there. So that was kind of step two. And then it's been with zoom zoom's obviously been awesome, but it's just been a reiteration of guys. We took this big dictionary and we, cut it to the table of contents and that's the only thing you have to learn right and we're gonna we're gonna communicate this fast and easy and i need you to understand these few things because of what i'm saying you're not gonna have to memorize all of this stuff i'm gonna tell you exactly what to do and if i don't tell you exactly what to do that means do this which is me telling you what to do so eliminating kind of as much of the big picture stuff, memorization stuff as possible, and just trimming the fat, trimming the fat, trimming the fat, getting down to that two, three, four word, you know, play call communication, and just understanding that, you know, every time we talk to them, you're never going to play as fast as you're about to practice. You're that's just never going to happen. You know, really starting to instill that in them. And then the coaches, we just been meeting, um, well, you know, once or twice a week to make sure that you know, what I'm saying and what I'm seeing, they all understand because of the verbiage backgrounds being different. Do you, are you trimming it, the fat even more since, you know, we've this whole lockdown situation that you're finding, Hey, whatever I had that was small, it might even be smaller based on the time period we will have with the kids and everything. Are you just like, no, this is it. I'm sticking with this and we will just ride this out. I had that conversation with a couple of coaches and confidence was reinstilled that you don't need to do that. This is, you know, this is very, very meat and potatoes. Even, even if we don't run a single one of these plays or the kids don't see a single one of these plays until August, we can get them all in, in a four day install a hundred percent. So that was, I, I, we had that conversation, but we really do feel that 
between, you know, with our base concepts and then, you know, read tags off of it, whether they be RPO or read option, um, we can, we can blossom to a huge playbook, but at the end of the day, five guys up front only have to learn four things and we're good to go. I like that. What is one thing in your opinion, since you, you know, you can't, I, I think you got a PhD in tempo at Baylor, uh, that you find that high school kid coaches that are using tempo are doing wrong and they can do something to make it right. What's your thoughts on that? <laughs> Don't, this is, it, I know this is, I feel like this is going to be a very divisive answer, but don't be afraid to call the same play. And what do you I mean by mean, that? Go, go, go deeper in that. I don't mean twice. Uh, I don't be afraid to call the same play five times in a row. Really? Why would you, if it ain't broke, baby. So uh, are you looking at yardage? Like let's, it has to get a certain amount of yards before you call it again. Or let's say you call a play it's only a one or two, let's say power, because I know you kind of like power a little bit or counter, whatever one you want. And it gets like one or two yards, but you were just right there to bust it. Are you calling the same play again? Or are you just going to call changing the formation? Really? Why would I? If I know, and I can say this because I watched a guy that coached on our staff that is that was at the high school ranks. I watched him do it. If you call power, if you call one power, power left, and the, when the back bucket steps, he sees false daylight and takes a backside A just because he overreads Mike's pursuit angle or whatever, blah, blah, blah. He gets two yards. But if he, if he trusts the play and goes place had A, he sweat. I mean, we're, we're splitting safeties. We're, we're striking up the band. Why the heck not? Unless, unless something happens where their DC starts yelling, my eyes in the sky say, hey, they, over, they filled that gap. They filled that gap. If I know it's there, take it. At the same time, if I if if we're simple as if we're as simple as we've talked about, and and I go I go three power uncovered, and he throws it, and the, my slot receiver gets two yards, because you know quarterback didn't make a great decision. We'll just call three power then take away the option. If even you know they pull blah blah blah, but we threw this out there, there ain't no DC at our level. That's going, hey, I know that they threw that bubble and they got two yards, but if they, he would have handed that ball off, they score a touchdown. There's no DC that makes that – his box guy makes that communication in five seconds. It's impossible. doesn't happen. And then off of that, okay, so we threw, we threw the uncovered. And so now either the corner takes inside leverage or they, they flip and walk a safety down and back the corner off. Okay, well, I'm going to hand it the second time. I'm probably going to get six yards. Well, then I'm going to call – three power switch, which now I'm just running un uncovered to the outside guy because I got great angles called the same play three times in a row, three different people who touched the ball, got a first down. Why? Nice. If they're not doing, if they're not doing anything from an alignment standpoint to stop your play, why is that a bad play? So then what does the defense have to do in order for you to change it? Just a straight up alignment or Zero. My box guy has to go, hey, check, 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 check. And they went zero. We're fading them up. Oh, wow. We're okay. mailbox. <laughs> I'm going to start using that. I'm going to start using that. All right, we got a question. Uh, Coach Greenfield wants to know, how many days was the installation at Baylor? Was it three days or was it a little bit long? Was it a four? Like you said, that's what y'all do. Was it y'all are so efficient? It was one day and everything was there. And then from that day forward, you were going super fast. Like, is that something you can talk about? Because your lips are very personal. You're like, I'm not going to say this. <laughs> no, it's just, it's, it's, you took my answer before I could say it. I didn't know an install schedule existed until I got to Tarleton and was GA. Really? Because they, I mean, in your off season prep, you know, your coaches can communicate with you a little bit. So that entire spring, hey, when we get out there, it's going to happen really fast. It's, you're going to be a deer in the headlights. Doesn't matter. We'll rep it enough. You'll figure it out. They're calling out the they're signaling the formation. Two coaches are yelling what the where what we're supposed to be. Hey, empty right, empty right, right. And guys are running there. Hey, blah, blah, blah. You know, fiddle farts to play, fiddle farts to play. And when a kid doesn't know what to do, he goes like this. His position coach tell I didn't know what his install schedule was until I was in grad school. Because it's like you said, it was all on the table. We're gonna run it. 
And if you don't know what to do, we're going to do it fast enough to where we run it four more times than we would if we hit it, had an install schedule. So by day two, you'll know what to do. Looking back, though, could you piece together an install schedule like they did just straight up power on this day, counter on this day, their form of inside zone? Or were y'all doing all three different concepts in the same day? And it really was, hey, we're going to just run these plays. And From then a run game standpoint, I, I, I mean, full disclosure, can't speak to like, oh, yeah, this was this day. What I can tell you is that from a passing game standpoint, what I would consider to be like an average install day from a passing game standpoint is like a max of four different combinations of some sort. Yeah, we were doing more than that. Okay. And it okay. was, and the reason we were doing more of that is just because of the manipulation of who's doing it. So it wasn't more, but it was. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, from a passing game standpoint, it was just throw it on the wall. It'll stick eventually. Okay. Now I'm going to ask this and you don't have, well, I don't want you to get into the specifics <laughs> of the DC, but how long did it take for wide receivers to rep it and to run it before it actually clicked? Cause I've heard, I've heard conflicting stuff. I've heard that it takes a while before you finally get, you know, the quarterback and the wide receiver and all that on the same page. I've also heard that it was almost immediate. Everyone just kind of got it. And it, it, they were like, why haven't we done this sooner? What was the learning curve before everyone felt comfortable? Um, it was, I mean, I don't think anybody felt comfortable until 2009, to be honest. But the, the confidence in them to call, like we knew what to do, mm -hmm. but to know that like, he called this play, we're going to run it, and it's going to be a completion. To know that, I don't think that came for an, for an entire year. But to be able to understand, hey, on this play, you do this, this, you know, these are what you're looking at, I, a week. Okay. You just, you, the thing that I think a lot of people get caught up on, it's with anything when you take this approach. Just do it enough. Right. You don't, and that's not to say that like you got to take the shotgun, you got to just throw the kitchen sink at them day one and just run a bunch of plays. You can have an install schedule, but whatever it is, just do it enough, play fast enough, or manipulate your, your periods of your practice schedule to rep it nonstop to where kids are dragging their tongue, exhausted, tired, and they'll learn it. Right. It, and it's, for me, it's so applicable now because kids are so ADHD that that's the only way to hold their attention. And when you, and if you're truly doing it, you're, you're eight deep at the receiver position of fully engaged. How much of it, and you're right, because now they have to pay attention because they don't know whether they're getting in or not. Exactly. Right. How much learning was put on film work after practice? Yes, it was there. And, okay, so the only reason why I asked that is because a lot of people, you know, they're saying tempo, we're, we're going to go as fast as possible, and then we'll coach it up and then study it and everything later on after practice. And I want to know, did y'all do the same thing, or was it really just, hey, you're just going to do reps? And it's really simple. We'll coach you up as we get the reps going. This is something, this is something that I took from Coach Babers, and by no means – by no means do I claim to like, this is the greatest coaching point. No one's ever thought of this, but it was new to me. Granted, I was eight, 19 years old, but it was new to me. And he's the one that told me. So I'm always going to credit him. Rep it a thousand million times in practice. Watch 30% of it. Because you're repping the same thing over and over and over and over. And there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of repetition, right? Your ex may make the same mistake as your Z or your Z may do the same good route or good thing as your X. You, you don't need to watch both. And then also don't make that 30% be all negative. Okay. Find, find anything and everything that goes wrong at least once sprinkle in the good, cut your, cut your meeting down or your, your notes down to 30% of what the practice reps were and then just coach the piss out of the details. Hey, look right here. We threw an uncovered and you took a bad first step. So when the corner triggered, you were in, you weren't in a great position to go cut him off and give us a two way go. And the reason you weren't in a great position is because you had your, 
inside foot up instead of your outside foot up. Even in that stance, if you'll step lateral instead of trying to be the attacker, understanding that we're playing in space, hey, that's the same thing that T-Dub did on play 76 and uh, Lanier did on play 83. They made that same mistake, but I want to show it to you in slow motion right here. All right, now on the flip side of that, here's you making the exact same play, but doing it great. Okay, well, we just covered 15 to 20% of all of our run game critiques with two cuts so you know just he would always he would always come to me because he was he openly admitted like exos illiterate he would say here's the here's the notes i need the cut up and we would have run you know thrown a number out 150 plays that day well we're gonna watch 15 of them or we're gonna watch 25 of them and if it's 25 eight to ten are gonna be really good plays this is awesome let's talk about it let's pat the guys on the back here's our 15 to 17 that sucked let's fix it and the only reason we're it's not because we don't like these guys it's because these guys made the same mistakes as these guys so we're just going to watch it once and you're lumping in all the other ones in case they want to go back and see themselves exactly the same exact thing so you're even simplifying watching film and keeping their attention because you're not just droning on and on exactly all right well i mean travis thank you so much for being here man that's that's this is freaking unbelievable. Uh, coaches, before you go, though, I need to brag on the man. Uh, he has a Twitter, which he, all you got to do is just ask him any questions. That's probably the best place to reach out, right, is on 100%. Twitter. But you got you to gotta get him on his Twitch channel, man. He, uh, What's your schedule? It's, is it Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Yeah, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, sometimes Sunday, depending on like if, if I link up with somebody who's like super busy, uh, then we'll hop on and do like a Sunday – like chalk talk or something, but usually just Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I try to stay opposite of the king. Oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Elvis, he he's, <laughs> he streams all the time. But what I like about what you do is you actually bring guests on, and you have like big time guests because you're you're well connected. You're from Texas, and you, you went to Baylor, and you're in that tree. I I I know people who know people. That's what I know. I don't know people directly, but I know people who know people, and so that's the angle I play. Oh. I like it. So what y'all need to do is you need to go ahead and click on the links. I put them in the chat. Uh, I will also link to these in the description and in the first comment. Uh, follow his Twitch. Also subscribe. He's got a YouTube channel as well where he's got highlights and everything. Subscribe to that. Is there anything you want to say before you go? Any Anything else you want to, you want to plug, man? Um, I, I don't know about plug, but I will say that um, I was very fortunate. Coach Mackey reached out, asked me to uh, – to put something together for the virtual summit and yes. first off great cause my man's out here killing it helping people when they need it um but i would just encourage anybody and everybody i would assume that they're all very well informed on it but it's a great opportunity to to support a program but it's also actually i I'm know be for, honest i haven't i haven't even announced it yet oh well oops. well the cat's out of the bag let, let, i'm gonna go ahead and announce it no no that's fine it's fine uh i am putting together an online summit and my man T Mac right here is going to be a part of that. I've got some other big time coaches that are going to be a part of it. And what we're doing, it's uh, the summit's going to be free. If you want the replay, you've got to purchase it. And the reason why is I'm trying, I'm, this is essentially a fundraiser. I want to take all this money and um, I'm going to do a raffle who either a high school or a middle school is going to win and I'm going to take the money from the replay and I'm just going to write a check to their uh, athletic department because I know with the lockdown and the uh, coronation, as I call it, it has destroyed fundraising because this is usually when athletic departments make their big time uh, stuff. So be on the lookout for that. That's probably going to go out, start signups and everything on Monday. And I, I promise you, fellas, I, I called in all of my favors on this. I've got a ton of uh, coaches that have already helped out on this and are going to promote it. So just be on the lookout for that. And actually, Trav, man, you're, I liked your clinic, man. I liked yeah. it. It was yeah. really good. I appreciate you. I, I asked the favor if you could do it, and you were like, yes. And I am very grateful for it. And I know the other coaches are going to love it as well. Man, I just I appreciated being included in the group. The, the only other thing I really want to say is I think that because there's a lot of side conversations about this and I know that you kind of have the platform to to communicate with with more people just because of the time and the effort that you've invested along with the quality of the content. But all of this stuff 
is, you know, for the most part, coaches have always been known to help coaches. You, you reach out, you make the call, you, you send a Twitter DM, whatever. And the vast majority of the time, you're going to get a yes more than you're going to get a no. And, you know, these little, these situations where, you know, you might pay for something here or there, those have always been to try and either it's been a break even thing, or it's been, Hey, I feel like this is great. And I put a lot of time into it. I would like to see a little bit of return. I just want to make sure that the coaching world and the coaching network doesn't lose that. One of the greatest things about this when I got out of the business world and came back is that it wasn't oversaturated with flash, you know, profit, flash marketing, go cash grab as fast as possible. I just hope everybody keeps in mind that like, especially in a time like this, you got all this time to research, to create your own content, to learn as much as you can. And don't be afraid to help somebody just because they want to learn. It doesn't always have to be about, you know, breaking even or, or making a profit. And that's just something that's, it's really been on my heart. And it's, you know, with everything that's going on without saying specifics or details or anything of that nature, it's just something that's kind of really been weighing on me. And I've had a couple lengthy conversations in private and I wanted just 90 seconds to, to put it out there of like, well, guys, we got to take care of each other because at the end of the day, it's not even about us. It's about us having an opportunity to help somebody be a better version of themselves. I couldn't have said it better. And that's why I started this channel. So I, I appreciate it. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to bring that back up to you in about a couple of weeks and you're going to come back on. And you're going to talk about DC now. <laughs> uh, I'm opinion on that now. I'm a... <laughs> uh, but that, again, thank y'all for uh, being here. I appreciate it. What we're going to do now is my boy and I, we're, we're going to play some Call of Duty because he's got me hooked on uh, Warzone. And y'all need to get on that and we can do quads as well because I have not had that much fun in a game. And probably since I was in high school, it was amazing. And I think is like what you said, it's the camaraderie of uh, Coach Canfield was on there as well. It was the uh, nothing but coaches actually playing a video game and actually communicating and just having fun. So y'all need to get on that. Um be on the lookout for the email for the uh, the Build Your Program Summit. That's what I'm calling it because everything in there you can apply. I mean, I, I it's the whole gamut. I've got offense. I've got defense. I've got coaches coming in talking about drills that you can do, um, how to use different software, how to fundraise, all of that. My whole thing is if you take you can take something for this summit and apply it to your program and actually help help it build it. That's the sales pitch. Until next time, coaches, let's continue to match the spread, score points, and have fun. I will see you all later.